family in Jesus. Hope you had a blessed weekend and uh, you're ready to start a new week. Amen. Uh, this morning we are finishing off with the last section in the book of John chapter 11, the last section of the story of the death of Lazarus. So uh, again, just to recap a little bit, when Jesus heard about the death of Lazarus, he started sharing with his disciples, maybe to go to Judea. They said, no, please don't go there because that's where the Jews want to kill you um, or harm you or stone you. And then he said, okay, I'm going alone to uh, Lazarus. And they also didn't want that. They didn't want to let Jesus out of their sight. They wanted to be with him. So then eventually Thomas, uh, doubting Thomas as they used to call him, Thomas was the one that said, let us all go, and if we have to die, then we die together. But uh, we're not staying here alone. Let's go with Jesus. So eventually they went there. Uh, so Jesus tested their faith uh, through that because Jesus was talking to them a lot about death. Then eventually, just outside of the town, uh, Martha met him. Martha started speaking to him. Jesus there challenged her faith also on death. She ran back and went to fetch Mary. Jesus waited right there for, for Mary. Mary came to meet Jesus and was immediately emotional uh, about uh, her brother passing away and asking Jesus why, why wasn't he here. If he was here, he could have healed her. Jesus felt her heart for her brother, for the loss of her brother, and started weeping with her. And then now, yeah... We are going to see, uh, so we've seen how the disciples dealt with the news of death and the challenge of faith uh, concerning death. We saw how Martha dealt with it. We saw how uh, Mary dealt with it. And now we're going into the last section. We're going to see how Jesus himself dealt with it. So if you want to follow this morning in the word of God, we're reading out of uh, John 11 from verse 38 this morning. And the Bible says, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. So this is the first time now that since Jesus has arrived there, this is the first time that Jesus is now actually at the tomb. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Now just... In, in our minds, we can think to ourselves that that is pretty permanent, that. that. That seals the deal when it comes to death. If you have been uh, put in a cave, your body has been prepared, and you've been put in a cave, and a huge stone has been rolled in front of the entrance, that basically says to everyone on the outside of the cave that there's nothing happening on the inside. There's, it's, it's dead. There's no life there. So, uh, verse 39, take away the stone, Jesus said. Now, this is, this is very interesting that, that Jesus said this. Jesus could have said, open the, the entrance or, or um, help us, let us enter or, or something like that. But Jesus was very specific here in saying, take away the the stone. Now, if we go through the Word of God, we can see that there are some references made to the weight of the world or references to death where the Lord uses stone, where He says that it weighs us down. The, the, the sin is like a stone that is weighing us down. And the first thing that Jesus says when He gets to the tomb is, is Roll away the stone. Move, move that stone away. Take the, the weight of what is happening here to everyone. Take that weight away. Because I want to do something with that. Then uh, the Bible goes on. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there Four days. Now, this is shortly after Jesus has spoken to Martha, challenging her on her faith. 
And, and Martha was the one that confessed that, yes, I believe. Yes, you are the Lord. Yes, you are the Messiah. Yes, you are the Son of God. And yes, you have come into this world. And yet, she is now again the first one <clears throat> to respond on Jesus asking them to take a step of faith. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? Isn't that what we sometimes do in our lives? Is that the Lord takes us through His Word and teaches us in His Word how our faith should be. And the Lord asks us questions through His Word and give us, gives us the answers and he, he edifies us and motivates us and encourages us. And while we're reading the Word, we, we, we believe sometimes and we feel with everything inside of us that we can now go out and we can conquer anything and we can move mountains and we can raise the spiritual dead and we can preach and teach. And that's all while we are um, busy with the Word. But then we go out into the world and Jesus presents that same challenge to us physically. So spiritually, while we are in our quiet time, in our inner room, spending time with our God, there where we've got the confidence and in the word of God, then, then, then we feel, yes, I can do this. The same with Martha. She was far away from the tomb, outside of the town, sitting down, comfortably with Jesus speaking to him and that's when she confessed yes Lord you are yes I believe you are the Messiah you the son of God you've been called into this world you can do anything but here standing in front of the door of death when Jesus says move that stone away Martha is the first one that steps forward and says Lord uh, you know please he's he's been dead for four days there's going to be a bad odor there Saying actually that, Lord, all you are going to find inside there is death. That's all. Now, Jesus never intended to walk into that tomb himself. He didn't need to. We're going to see now. So, verse 14. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you, he's speaking yet to Martha, exactly what we said now. Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. So yeah, the, the Lord is now in front of everyone. The Lord is, is speaking to Martha plainly, with, without any confusion, and saying to her, Martha, I spoke to you outside, saying to you that if you've got faith, that anything can happen. What? Why are you saying this? Then the word goes on, verse 41, so they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. You see, Jesus, because of all the time that he spent with his father, because of not doing or saying anything unless he, he sees the father do or say it, Jesus already knew what the Father was going to do through him there. So that's why he prayed this way in front of the people. Jesus knew that the Father was going to raise Lazarus. And for the first time in that area, the people were going to see the, the, the power of the resurrection in Jesus. So this is why Jesus prays, prays this way and says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe you sent me. So what Jesus is doing here is, just like that saying where everyone says, yeah, the proof is in the pudding. You know, I'll, I'll believe it if I see it. So even before they see it, Jesus is saying here outside, he's saying, thank you, Father, that you have heard me. Because I, I asked for this a while ago, Father God. But you have heard me, and I'm saying it now out nice and loud so that everyone can hear that you have already heard me. When you sent that messenger to come and tell me that Lazarus is sick, you heard me then. And all this time I knew what you were going to do, but I'm saying it for the benefit of these people that they will know that you heard me. And then... 
Verse 43, when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The Bible stipulates here, Jesus said it in a loud voice. Now, if we go back through the book of John, everywhere where Jesus called his disciples, or everywhere where Jesus healed someone, the Bible doesn't say he did it in a loud voice. Jesus just spoke. So what makes this different, again, is that Jesus is now spending time with those close to him, preparing them for his death that is, that is soon going to come. We're going to see it in, in the book of John. And so this, it just makes clear sense that this is the very moment where Jesus um, asserts his authority in front of his disciples and, and, and uh, members of his extended family over the power of death. So here Jesus, in a loud voice, says, Come out! You are not dead anymore. I am calling you, come yet to me. I am the, the, the life. I am the light. The Bible says I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is calling him to come to him, to the life. And death has no power over Jesus. That's why it is so beautiful that the Bible says Jesus said it in a loud voice. Come yet. You don't need to stay there anymore. I have power over that that is holding you now, that day. And then, um, verse 44, the dead man came out, his hands and his feet, wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Now this too, why Jesus said this was, let him go. Let him be free. That's what Jesus does in our life, brothers and sisters, is Jesus makes us free. Jesus causes us to come out of that grave, even sometimes with the, the grave clothes still on. And Jesus takes it off and he says, go, let them go. Let them be free. That's why in the, in the book of Matthew, Jesus said to his disciples, I want you to go out into the world. Don't stay here. Go. Be free. Teach the people about who I am and, and, and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let the people be free. They don't have to be in this cave with a stone rolled in front of it anymore. They are they have been set free by the one who has conquered death. And this, we can see, is so beautiful. Right in the end of, of the, the book of John, we'll see this, where they ran into the tomb where Jesus had already, already been raised from the dead. And what was the very thing that was lying inside the tomb where Jesus was buried? Was the grave clothes. And that's the one thing, family in Jesus, if, that we can take out of this whole story. That is the one thing that Jesus does not want us to, to carry. That's the one thing that Jesus does not want us to be dressed with and clothed with, is grave clothes. Jesus did not come so that you and I can walk around dressed with grave clothes. Jesus came to strip us of those grave clothes, make us free and clothe us with his splendor and his glory and with the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this is such a beautiful piece of scripture. This a beautiful ending to this story. And, and again, because of the power of Jesus, what he did here. The word started spreading, and we're going to see the result of this. Again, just like where Jesus healed the, the lame man at the pool, um, there, there was a ripple effect 
in that area. And, and we're going to see, as we carry on tomorrow through the uh, book of John, we're going to see what the ripple effect was of Jesus performing this miracle because <clears throat> in those days, if you can remember the story of uh, Moses with the, uh, uh, standing in front of Pharaoh and, and Pharaoh had these uh, men that could cast the spells and, and everything that, that Moses did, the, the, they did as well. The magicians did as well. So in this day, uh, Jesus healing people uh, wasn't really something new to the majority of the people there because they had magicians that could do similar things. Not exactly the healing that Jesus did, but they could perform similar things. But here, what Jesus did here to raise a man that had been dead for four days, and this man is now alive. And there are witnesses that were there when they buried him. He was dead. He was declared gone. And Jesus comes and all he does is, Jesus didn't even lift a hand to move the rock. He had someone else do it. Jesus just stood there. They moved the, the, the stone. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come. You don't belong there. Come out. And I, I'm thinking almost immediately, someone in that crowd that witnessed that turned around and started running into that town, proclaiming to everyone, you must come and have a look. Lazarus is alive. He's awake. He's moving around. He's, he's, he's gone back to his house to sit down for a good meal. He hasn't had one in four days. Amen. So we'll see the ripple effect of this. Especially this thing that nobody can replicate. That nobody can, can do the same as what Jesus did. Or to look the same as what Jesus did. So are we going into an exciting piece in the Word of God now? And um, we'll carry on with that uh, tomorrow. But for now, please, let's pray together. <clears throat> Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. For this weekend that you blessed us with and this brand new day that you have given us, Lord Jesus. This brand new week that you have given us. We thank you for the potential that is in this week. We thank you, Father God, for the gifts of the Holy Spirit, for the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us exceedingly abundantly through the truth of your word. We thank you, Father God, that you, you, you are going to do um, greater things through us because your son Jesus said that to us, Lord. He, he said in his word that these things that I have been doing, you will do them as well, but you will do even greater things. And Lord, we cannot wait for those greater things and we call them today in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to come to manifest in us and through us. And we pray, Lord, that our conduct will always be in such a manner that it is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ and your kingdom. And that it is um, edifying to your kingdom and, and, and the uh, body of Christ, Lord Jesus. Thank you for everything that you are doing in our lives, that you are giving us, that you are helping us with, that you are teaching us. Love you, Lord Jesus. And um, we are excited about this week, Lord. We thank you for everything we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, family in Jesus. Uh, I, I hope and pray. That you have a blessed uh, start of the week um, and, and that you get uh, time to spend with the Lord more and more and more this week uh, in everything you do. Even when you're working, you don't have to stop speaking to the Lord. When you're driving, you don't have to stop speaking to the Lord. It, it, it's just always wise that when you drive and, and you want to pray, <laughs> just keep your eyes open on, on the road. Uh, don't close them. Amen. So I hope you have a Blessed day today until we meet again tomorrow. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.